Hello, and welcome to Dr. Vaughn's Science Theater. I love calculations. Yay, yeah, yay, yeah, yay. Yeah. The Michaelis Minton model, if you're interested in how fast an enzyme makes products, we might want to go this route. There's very sophisticated math involved in the derivation of the Michaelis Minton equation, which ultimately is derived from the mechanism for catalyzed enzymatic reactions. We assume that there is an ES complex formed. We assume that the ES complex is going to be in rapid equilibrium with the free enzyme. The breakdown of the ES complex to form the products is assumed to be slower than the one formation of the ES complex and two breakdown of ES to reform E plus S. So in other words, K2, the rate of forming the product is going to be slower than K1 and the K minus one. K2 is going to be the rate limiting step and that's why we can just focus on it. If it's the slowest reaction, then that's all that matters when we're talking about velocity. So substrate concentration at one half of the Vmax is the K sub M. This is an inverse measure of the affinity of the enzyme for the substrate. This can be used to determine differences between enzymes. The lower Km, the higher affinity. When the rate of a reaction is half of the Vmax, the substrate concentration is going to be equal to the Km. Km can be used to characterize the affinity an enzyme has for a substrate. The significance of Km, it's the substrate concentration at 50% of saturation. So we have 50% of the enzyme active sites occupied by a substrate, or half the Vmax. So K2 is the slowest, so Km is almost the dissociation constant for the ES complex, and it's, it is a measure of how tightly the substrate is bound to an enzyme. The turnover number is going to be ultimately how we can characterize our enzymes from one to another. We're going to call the K2 value the Kcat, which is going to be a direct measure of the conversion of the substrates to the products. So it's the number of substrate molecules turned over per enzyme per second. Overall rate of reaction is going to be limited by its slowest step, which is this step from the ES complex to the products plus enzyme. So it's basically a measure of efficiency of an enzyme. We can set up a ratio, which is a measure of activity of an enzyme or catalytic efficiency, and that is the Kcat divided by the Km. Km is going to be a useful indicator for the affinity of the enzyme for the substrate. If you have a low Km, the enzyme has a high affinity for the substrate. If you have a high value for the K2, you have a high measure of catalytic efficiency. If you have a low Km, you have a high affinity for substrate. So a high Kcat to Km ratio is going to be an efficient enzyme. You either have a large Kcat or you have a small Km. Either is going to cause this high ratio. So this Kcat divided by a Km ratio is used to determine the efficiency of enzymes. So if we look at a substrate concentration by velocity plot, we have some first order kinetics, then we have zero order kinetics. At a low substrate concentration, the velocity is going to be proportional to the substrate concentration. We call that first order kinetics. Then as you keep adding substrate, the velocity is going to become independent of the substrate concentration, not going to be increasing anymore, and that is zero order kinetics. When you first mix the substrate and enzyme, you can measure immediately an initial velocity, and what this plot is, is you're going to keep adding different concentrations of substrate and measuring that initial velocity and plotting it. And so you can see as you reach a certain substrate concentration, because all of the enzymes are saturated, it won't matter. Now, if looking at this plot, substrate concentration by velocity, initial velocity actually, um, you cannot determine the Vmax because this hyperbola is going to reach an asymptote because you can't add enough substrate to actually get it completely saturated to determine the Vmax. You can get close, but either it's going to be a monetary thing or solubility thing, but either way, we can't determine it by this experiment of adding more substrate in, in say 20 test tubes, you add varying amounts of substrate and test the initial velocity to get this plot, ultimately you're not going to be able to add the maximum amount of substrate to get the Vmax. We can measure the total amount of enzyme we put into the solution. We can measure the total amount of substrate, measure the initial velocity. So that's enough for us to get this plot. 
but it's not enough for us to get the VMAX or the KM. You know, we can guesstimate on half the VMAX, and KM is going to equal a substrate concentration at half the VMAX. But again, if we don't really know what the VMAX is, we're not getting a perfect KM with this graph. So again, in this plot, we're going to vary the substrate concentration in, say, 30 test tubes. We're going to have the same concentration of buffer, same amount of enzyme. The only thing that we're going to change, the only variable, is changing the substrate concentration. And then we're going to, as soon as it's mixed, we're going to measure the initial velocity and come up with this plot. So the higher substrate concentrations are going to give higher velocities until ultimately the enzyme's saturated and we just don't get any higher velocity. It makes a hyperbola. Ultimately, from doing this plot, we can estimate the Michaelis constant, the Km. So say you have an enzyme that has a higher affinity for a substrate, it's going to have a low Km value, so it takes a little bit of substrate to get half of the Vmax. Or an enzyme doesn't have an affinity for a substrate and you have to just keep flooding it with a substrate before it will act upon the substrate and do anything, you're going to have a high Km, so it's an inverse relationship there. Because we can't reach Vmax, we're going to use Vmax divided by 2 and compare enzymes with this. And this is going to be giving us the Km. The Km is substrate concentration it takes to get to Vmax divided by 2. So Km doesn't equal Vmax divided by 2. It is actually the substrate concentration that it takes to get to Vmax divided by 2. High Km, low affinity for the substrate. Low Km, high affinity for the substrate. We can guess what the Km is. We can get a pretty good educated guess on the Km and the Vmax from this plot. But in science, we, we really want to be precise. What we can do is take the reciprocal of each one of these plots and make a double reciprocal plot. And if you look at what we've done to the equation, it's 1 over V equals Km over Vmax, 1 over the substrate concentration, plus 1 over Vmax. It should look a little familiar to you, the formula for a straight line, which is Y equals MX plus B. So now we have the Y is 1 over V, the X is 1 over the substrate concentration. So what you've done is you made a reciprocal plot now we have a slope of a line of Km over Vmax, you know, which is cool and all, but it's not really telling us exactly anything. Um, but the y-intercept, the B, is 1 over Vmax. So we can actually look at the y-intercept, get the value for 1 over Vmax, and then do some algebra to find out Vmax. Okay, another thing that you can figure out is we couldn't have gone negative with the original graph because obviously you can't have a negative substrate concentration. But when you extrapolate the line, you can actually get negative 1 over Km, which is the x-intercept. So we can get the Km value. But if you have the Vmax, you can get the Kcat and determine the efficiency of the enzyme. The Km, remember, is determining the affinity that the enzyme has for the substrate. We're going to invert the numerical value of each data point. We call this a line weaver burke plot. We get a straight line. All the points are in the, the, the positive quadrant because we can't have a negative concentration of substrate. But you can draw a hypothetical line. You're going to extrapolate from your known data to get the Km at the x-intercept. And again, if an enzyme binds multiple substrates, it's going to have multiple Km values. But if you take the reciprocals, then it's the formation of a straight line equation, y equals mx plus b. This gives us the line weaver burt double reciprocal plot. It's easier to draw a best straight line through a set of points than to estimate through a curve. We're going to extrapolate to increase the substrate concentration on both ways. The most efficient enzyme is going to have a high ratio of the Kcat to K over Km. If you have a high Kcat or a low Km, it is a perfect enzyme. If you have a high Kcat and low Km, it is a perfect enzyme. It's going to work fast, but you don't need much substrate to get to half the Vmax. Any change to this perfect enzyme, so a mutation, is going to make it less efficient. It cannot become any more perfect. So it's evolved to the point where it can't get any more rapid than it is. What actually limits the rapidity of this enzyme is how quickly the substrate can diffuse through an aqueous solution into the active site. So with a perfect enzyme, the limiting factor is the diffusion of the substrate. And so we're going to call a perfect enzyme a diffusion-controlled enzyme. And this is a good thing because it's going to keep these enzymes from just making crazy amounts of product too quickly. So you never, never want anything in the body to have the ability to make an absurd amount with no control whatsoever. 
then you're gonna run out of raw materials and have problems. Active sites make me so active. Okay, let's talk about the active site. Here's an enzyme. There's going to be an indention or a little cave, however you want to think of it. This is going to be the part of the globular enzyme that's actually reacting with the substrate. In this indention, we're going to have amino acids that have specific residues, the R groups. These are going to have characteristics we need for the individual substrate. They're going to match charge, pKa, hydrophobicity, flexibility, reactivity. All of these are going to be part of the active site. Sometimes, again, we have cofactors, coenzymes, and prosthetic groups that are also assisting the reaction. Remember, review pKa is going to determine whether or not you have protonated or deprotonated or the Zwitter ion form of the amino acid residue, which is gonna make a difference with the reaction of the enzyme to the substrate. Remember that histidine, which is going to be a prevalent amino acid in an active site, this has a pKa of six, which is close to the physiological pH of 7.4. So it's gonna be prevalent in a lot of enzyme active sites. It can act as both a base and an acid, which is very helpful when we're looking at reactions. So say you have a lysine on a substrate, it would make sense that there would probably be an aspartic or glutamic acid in the active site. So we have an electrostatic attraction. We have hydrogen bonds that form. Hydrogen bonds are the most common bonds there are, and they're easily formed and easily broken. We're going to have some hydrophobic reactions, but each active site of each enzyme is going to be unique. It's going to have its own properties that make it specific for the substrate it acts upon. So again, the active site is the area of the enzyme that's going to bind to the substrate. It has a unique geometric shape designed exactly to fit the molecular shape of the substrate. Each enzyme is going to be substrate specific. Let's look at some examples here with this uh, chart. We have amino acid residues. We have the general acid form. In the, it's the proton donor, and then we have the general base form, which is the proton acceptor. So let's just look at a couple of examples of what might be in, an, in any given active site. With glutamic acid and aspartic acid, we have the carboxylic acid group. That hydrogen is going to be donated when it's in the general acid form. And then, of course, it can accept that hydrogen back in the base form. So in the case of a low pH environment, say like the stomach, pepsin is going to have some, some of these acidic amino acid residues prevalent in its active site. Lysine and arginine, here we have a nitrogen donating a hydrogen, and then it can accept it back in the base form. Cysteine, we're going to be donating the hydrogen in the sulfhydryl group, and then of course it can accept it back. Histidine, remember this one has a pKa of 6, so it's going to be really common in those areas with physiological pH, which is most of the body. The nitrogen of the amidazole group is going to be donating a hydrogen and then accepting it back in the base form. Serine, can donate a hydrogen and take one back in the base form. And then tyrosine, which also has a hydroxyl group, can donate and take it back in the base form. Back to histidine, which has a pKa of 6. In one step, it could be a donor, and in another, it can be an acceptor. So that's what makes it so important with the active sites. So here's just an example substrate. You're going to have various amino acid residues that are going to come into the attraction of the substrate to the active site. Here's just um, an example where we have a hydrophobic interaction, and it's going to fit like a lock and key to another hydrophobic molecule or a cluster of hydrophobic molecules in the active site. Here we have an NH. You'd expect a hydrogen bond. It's going to, because N has a hydro, higher electronegativity value than hydrogen, so you know it's not sharing equally and that hydrogen is going to be partially positive, and it's going to look for a partially negative negative molecule to bind with. Here we have a straight up negative acid. It's going to look for a positive base for an electrostatic attraction. Oxygen, and you'd expect it to hydrogen bond as well. So the corresponding active site is going to match up perfectly or relatively per perfectly with the substrate. We have two different models of active site binding. We have the lock and key mechanism, which is the older line of thinking. Lock and key is exactly what it sounds like. The enzyme is the lock and the substrate is the key. The enzyme is going to bind to the substrate 
substrate in the active site. Only certain substrates can fit in the active site. It's very rigid with this model. And again, the amino acid residues are going to help the substrate bind. And that one's just pretty simple. The other model is the induced fit model. The enzyme is more flexible. It's not rigid, which makes sense because we think of our proteins as being flexible, not rigid. The enzyme and the active site change shape to bind the substrate. So it's kind of, that's why it's called induced fit. It's like if you shake hands with someone, your hands don't immediately fit perfectly, but you both tighten, hopefully not too tight, and make them fit more perfectly. So that would be an induced fit example. It has a higher range of specificity with this model. So you're going to get an enzyme catalyzing more substrates. And when you change shape, you can improve catalysis. So that makes sense. It, it's able to get into that transition state like configuration easier if it's able to move. We also call the lock and key model the Fisher model. The induced fit the induced fit model is actually a better descriptor for enzymes because it takes into account the enzyme flexibility. In the active site, hydrogen bonds are going to be the most common, but we can even make covalent bonds, which are thought to be permanent, for a period of time in the transient state. But if it's an enzyme, it's going to release the product and itself be unchanged, even if it did make a temporary covalent bond. The lock and key model is assuming a high degree of similarity between the shape of a substrate and the geometry of the binding site. It does not take into consideration the conformational flexibility. The induced fit is probably more accurate because proteins do have three-dimensional flexibility. When binding induces the conformational change, it's mimicking the transition state or when the enzyme forms the ES complex. That's that on an energy diagram, it's the top, the peak. So when it changes and it binds, that's creating the ES complex. And that makes more sense than the substrate just binding like a locking key. All right, let's go over an example. I'm going to select chymotrypsin. Chymotrypsin is a digestive enzyme. It is a component of pancreatic juice. It's going to act in the duodenum. It's a protease enzyme performing proteolysis, which is the breakdown of a protein or polypeptide. So it's going to be acting upon peptide bonds. It is going to prefer to cleave the amide bonds where the carboxyl side of the amide bond is a large hydrophobic amino acid, such as tyrosine, tryptophan, and phenylalanine. It is going to prefer tyrosine. So the amino acids are going to contain that aromatic ring that in their side chain that's going to fit into the hydrophobic pocket of chymotrypsin. Chymotrypsin can also hydrolyze other amide bonds in peptides, but just at slower rate. It's also going to cleave peptide bonds at a leucine, histidine, or glutamic acid, or methionine. It can also cleave ester bonds. Looking at what happens in chymotrypsin before we actually go over the details, we have an enzyme that starts, it's going to bind with a substrate. We have acylation occurring. This is a quick step. We make an acyl enzyme. There's another step, deacylation, input water into the system, and then we have the free enzyme plus the product. There is a transient covalent bond made during the catalysis. Before we get into it, let's look at the catalytic triad. We have three amino acids that have very important roles in the active site of chymotrypsin. We have aspartic acid 102, histidine 57, and serine 195. If you remember, aspartic acid is negative at physiological pH. This is going to be at a pH of 7.5 to 8.5 because this is acting in the duodenum, but it's still going to be an acid. The histidine 57, remember the pKa is 6, serine 195, serine is a hydroxyl group. Now, these numbers are telling you where these amino acid residues are in the, in the polypeptide chain. So it's their position in the primary structure of the protein. But when we have the 3D folding in the tertiary structure, we're going to fold these three amino acids where they're in the perfect spatial organization to be able to control this active site reactions. So the 3D folding puts them in close proximity. And just a side note, all serine proteases, which is what a chymotrypsin is, are going to have this same catalytic triad. So they like working together. So in short, histidine is going to pull a hydrogen off serine, and it's going to create what we call a nucleophile. 
This nucleophile is now going to be seeking a nucleus. We're going to call that an alkoxide ion. Now, why would it seek a nucleus? Because it's negative. And what's in a nucleus? We have protons and neutrons. Who cares about neutrons because they're neutral? So a nucleus is positive. So it's going to be a nucleophile because it's seeking a nucleus, a positively charged nucleus. Now, this happens when the substrate binds. Histidine pulls the hydrogen off serine, creates a nucleophile. Now, this is going to reposition the triad where the nucleophile can become created when the substrate binds. So this is going to be the first step. The second step, we're, we're basically going to be creating another nucleophile. So let's just go over the steps, the overall mechanism of chymotrypsin. So looking at this diagram, just follow along. We have the proper substrate binding to the active site. Remember, this is a protease, so it's a protein. We're going to form the alkoxide ion. The nucleophile is formed when histidine pulls the hydrogen off serine. Remember, the histidine is 57 and serine is 195, but because of 3D folding, we're in close proximity. Now, we have the carbon of the carb carbonyl group is what the nucleophile seeks. So on the substrate, it is going to look for the carbonyl group. We're going to form an unstable tetrahedral intermediate. This is unstable. We don't want it to be stable, and we want to quickly get rid of it before it starts acting on the enzyme. We're going to make this tetrahedral fall apart by stabilizing the structure in an oxyanion hole. This is going to allow the intermediate to fall apart quickly without reacting with the enzyme. This oxyanion hole stabilizes this so it can fall apart and not act on the enzyme. Then we have the slower step. Here is when we're breaking the peptide bond. So half the peptide is going to be linked covalently to the OH group and the other half of the peptide leaves. So this is a transient covalent bond. So now what we need is another nucleophile created. So we're waiting for the water to diffuse into the active site. Nitrogen is going to the nitrogen is going to pull a proton off the water. It leaves a reactive hydroxyl group, which is a reacting nucleophile. It's going to break that bond between the enzyme and substrate. And this one is the slower step because we're waiting for water to diffuse into the active site. So once we break the bond, the product can diffuse out of the active site and the enzyme is back to normal. So the key items you need to take away from this is that we have the catalytic triad which works together to create a nucleophile by the proper binding of the substrate to the active site. The histidine is going to start this by pulling the proton from serine. It's going to attack the carbonyl carbon of the tetrahedral intermediate. That's the quick step. Half of the peptide is going to leave. Half of it's going to remain covalently bonded. We wait for water to diffuse in. We create a second nucleophile, which will attack the carbonyl carbon, again, breaking the bond and letting it go. Then we have the enzyme regenerated. So that's how chymotrypsin active site works. Oh, steric enzymes are my all-time favorite. Okay, let's talk about allosteric enzymes. If we look at a plot of increasing substrate concentration by increasing initial velocity, we no longer are going to get a hyperbolic plot. Instead, we're going to find a sigmoidal curve, which coincidentally, if you remember the oxygen saturation curves of hemoglobin, it was also a sigmoidal curve. The reason is because we have some allosteric control involved. There are different kinds of inhibition. We will talk about two of them. The first one being competitive inhibition and the second one being non-competitive inhibition. So let's discuss competitive inhibition first. A competitive inhibitor is going to bind to the active site of an enzyme and prevent the substrate from entering. So it's going to be a similar shape to the substrate and it's going to block the substrate. So this is going to result in a decrease in the number of enzyme substrate complexes that can form. Most of the time a portion of the inhibitor is going to mimic a portion of the substrate. The only way to overcome this is to have so much substrate that it can overcome the inhibition because of the increased probability of a substrate molecule bumping into the active site rather than the inhibitor. So substrate concentration can overcome competitive inhibition. On the non-competitive inhibition, these do not enter the active site. They don't mimic the substrate, but they are going to bind to another region of the enzyme. We're going to call this the allosteric site. 
So they're not going to be mimicking the substrate at all. They're going to have their own shape and bind in another location. Perfect. This is Brenda the Not-So-Good Witch signing off for today. See you next time on Dr. Bond's Science Theater.